Sir Victor Pritchett, writer, critic, and also an acquaintance of Orwell's, wrote, He belongs to no group, joins no side. If he dallies with the idea, he turns out to be a liability to his party. George Orwell is rashly, almost bleakly, almost colourlessly and uncomfortably on his own. I should add that this is the same writer who wonderfully described Orwell as, quote, the wintry conscience of a generation, now a well-known accolade, a reference to his ability to speak the harsh, biting truths of his day. But this idea of Orwell's independence, there is great truth in it. Orwell always seemed to stand alone, fiercely alone, swimming against the tide and encouraging others to do the same. Part of this was that he was, truly, an independent thinker, and he was brave enough to speak what he considered to be the truth without the fear of being a pariah. This almost mystical ideal of human decency guide him throughout life like a North Star. When the idea was violated, or under threat of violation, even by people of a similar political disposition, he wouldn't hesitate to criticise whatever movement or group from within. Embracing a movement did not mean being uncritical of it. If the movement neglected or favoured an injustice, he couldn't quietly toe the line so that the movement could appear unified and credible. For this reason, he rightly said he could never be a politician. Quote, I have never belonged to a political party, and I believe that even politically, I am more valuable if I record what I believe to be true and refuse to toe a party line. Speaking what he believed was the undiluted truth was more important than the friction that could result from his critiques. Freedom, as he famously wrote, is the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. I'd be repeating myself if I once again cited examples of this, but his contrarianism crops up over and over. This is largely a result of the apparent contradictions between his political stances, namely as an anti-imperialist and a fierce patriot, a socialist opposed to Marx and all of Britain's left-wing parties, a utopian and a realist, a republican and a monarchist, an atheist and an Anglican sympathiser. We could go on. He alienated himself by hammering home the blind spots and inconsistencies of his fellow thinkers, or rather, unthinkers. Movements can breed dogma and groupthink. Orwell was all too aware of this. Like many great humanists in history, his strong sense of injustice was firmly rooted in basic principles, principles over which he never lost sight and which he used to guide his thoughts instead of the dictates of group leaders. He pleaded people to do the same, to strip off the nonsense and think about what was important. Of course, he ticked many people off doing this. Going against the grain is often seen as heretical. People don't like to be challenged on inconsistencies in their outlook. And to add insult to injury, it's true that he could be extremely, many times unfairly rude, and outwardly at least self-righteous. But as mentioned earlier, to have done all this did he not have some kind of a contrarian streak in him? Was it all the pursuit of principles and intellectual consistency? Or was there also something in his character to go against the grain? Orwell's famous essay, Such Such Were the Joys, on his time at St. Cyprian's Preparatory School, depicts school children routinely terrorised and shamed by headmasters Mr. and Mrs. Wilkes. Dickensian figures who run the school like despots. They're presented as sadistic, elitist bullies who torment, guilt trip, and repeatedly beat the young Eric Blair. Now, there's bountiful reason to believe that Orwell exaggerated many of his claims for literary effect or out of self-pity. Equally, there is reason to believe quite a lot of it, and that the school was unusually cruel even by the standards of the day. Strong third-party evidence suggests Mrs. Wilkes, especially savaged by Orwell, and a much debated figure by biographers, had a temperamental Jacqueline Hyde streak, and a questionable fitness for children's education. 
Favoritism was rife. It appears children who were in her favour remember her fondly, those who weren't, including Orwell, despised her. The biographical value of the essay is so contentious that, mainly for time purposes, I won't even attempt to separate fact from fiction, or to bother with any sweeping psychological speculations. But since Orwell wrote about the school elsewhere, and also spoke negatively about it in private settings, it seems the experience was highly unpleasant, and potentially traumatic for him. It was an environment that could certainly have fostered a premature aversion to authority. This appears to be the memory of schoolmate Cyril Connolly, quote, I was a stage rebel, Orwell a true one. And this is especially telling as Connolly clearly admired Orwell, and particularly in youth for his talents as a poet, as we've seen. Another contemporary at St. Cyprian's recalled that Mrs. Wilkes had the habit of pulling on children's hair. The young Eric Blair apparently cottoned on to this, and we're told covered his own in grease so that her fingers would slip off. Connolly also remembered Orwell's attitude towards a particular school ritual while at Eton, whereby the boys would touch their caps whenever a master walked by. For Connolly, it was a harmless courtesy, and so he was surprised when he discovered that the young Blair, quote, resented passionately the indignity of the servile action demanded of him. This idea, I should add, appears numerous times across 1984 as a symbol of class oppression. His Etonian days clearly stayed with him. Another student had a photograph of Eric in school uniform, smoking a cigarette. The act of smoking alone could have led to temporary expulsion. Allowing himself to be photographed was playing with fire. Orwell wrote that he did no work at the school. This is typical exaggeration. But teachers did note his laziness and lacklustre performance, quote, always a bit of a slacker and a dodger, an important schoolmaster remembered. Like many of his peers, he was already mocking British sacred cows, Christianity, the royal family, the officer training corps, etc. In a sort of chauvinistic ceremony organised by the school after the Treaty of Versailles, he and his friends mocked and sniggered at the proceedings, replacing the original words of the songs with blasphemous or other seditious phrases. After graduating from Eton, while studying for his entry exam for the India office at a specialised academy, he befriended, quote, a rather wild young man, who had apparently been expelled from secondary school. Together, they discovered the birthday of the academy's headmaster. For whatever reason, they sent him a dead rat, with a birthday note, signed with their names, and were promptly expelled. Ironically, even Orwell's decision to go to Burma was somewhat rebellious. He was following family tradition and his father's footsteps, but the majority of his peers went on to further education, often Oxbridge. Colonial service was a fast pass to manhood. It came with authority, prestige, purpose, comfort, to the young Blair's imagination, it was also the exotic East. Foreignness, mystery, adventure. Oxbridge, meanwhile, in his mind, meant prolonged snobbishness, dreary intellectuals, Peter Pan hedonism, and Nancy boys. His words, not mine. All this in dull, grisly, interwar England. Of course, a strong motivation could well have been the desire to make his father proud or if not, at least not to damage his reputation. And this was constant throughout Orwell's life. In all his rebellions, he took special pains to ensure his family never felt their brunt. Naturally, the service was completely ill-suited to his character. He rejected imperialism, and the sadist it was turning him into. Besides the personal nature of the rebellion, as we've seen, it was arguably his first and last against an organised concrete system which he had consciously and deliberately chosen to be part of. As for its formativeness, if you look at his life with some distance, it seems all of his future rebellions flow fairly logically, in a sort of domino effect, from that initial decision to quit the service and speak out on behalf of the oppressed and underprivileged. Before 1937, his rebellions were mainly societal, aiming at empire, capitalism, consumerism and religion, among others. 
Thereafter, until his death, his rebellions were more politically focused, gaining yet more battle scars by targeting the Soviet Union and its sycophants at home and elsewhere. In each case, the rebellions were preceded by some sort of naive phase, oblivion to the real conditions of tramps and beggars, to the conditions in the industrial north, or to the factional divisions of the Republican army in Spain and the Stalinist infiltration. In each case, he would learn the truth by immersing himself, and after that, he urgently wanted others to know and understand what he had seen. To state that these rejections demonstrated the same sort of insubordination he had displayed as a teenager would be naive. A rebellious streak certainly would have facilitated them. Bravery too. But in each case, strong principles and a near pathological hatred of tyrants and tyranny crucially forged, I would argue, in Burma, was guiding the way. He clearly relished and took pride in his social rejections in the same way that he took pride in considering himself a failure. Nowhere is this more apparent than in his class revolt. It's rather ironic that in The Road to Wigan Pier, he devotes such a large section to condemning bourgeois baiters and to the difficulty for middle-class socialists to abolish class differences. Quote, I cannot proletarianise my accent or certain of my tastes or beliefs, and I would not if I could. Why should I? I don't ask anybody else to speak my dialect. Why should anybody else ask me to speak his? Well, we actually have various accounts of the exact opposite, that he did develop a more working class accent, or at least he gradually suppressed his Etonian accent, so that his accent was sometimes described as unusually, quote, classless. John Morris, who worked in Orwell's department at the BBC, described one of his many irritations with the man. Quote, When we talked, he always tried to behave in an aggressively working class manner, and the effect was to make me talk like an unrepentant reactionary. This reflected in his dress sense, too. He had always been scruffy, but his old tweed jackets, his baggy, patched corduroy trousers and unpolished shoes, all of which, quote, maintained exactly the same degree of shabbiness, were part of the image many who knew him well believed he consciously cultivated. Quote, he looked the real thing, remembered socialist author and essayist Jack Common, upon meeting Orwell in the early 1930s during his down and out days, quote, outcast, gifted pauper, kicker against authority, perhaps near criminal. But then his speech and mannerisms destabilised Common. Quote, a sheep in wolf's clothing, I thought, taking in the height and stance, accent and cool built-in superiority, the public school presence. I should stress now that this does not make Orwell a hypocrite. In The Road to Wigan Pier, he does not say that abolishing class differences is undesirable. On the contrary, he says it should be an aim for any socialist, but within the bounds of reason and feasibility. He says it's extremely difficult. Quote, To abolish class distinctions means to abolish a part of yourself. When Common met him, Orwell's class revolt was more extreme, as he was mingling with tramps, criminals and beggars, not the working classes. The affectation would have been more obvious. But even so, Orwell would have delighted in these sorts of testimonies to read that others noticed him abolishing his middle-class background even if they thought he was affected. They would have been promising signs to him that his class revolt was actually working. If anything, it demonstrates his seriousness to the cause. Of course, he didn't have a working-class background, least of all a background as a social outcast. He could never truly be a working-class man. But, as Morris stated, quote, nothing gave him more pleasure than to be mistaken for one. Biographer and political theorist Bernard Crick reckons that Orwell's proletarianization predominantly wasn't affected, that his social rebellion had begun so early on and was felt so intensely that much of its outward signs developed almost organically, and like his dress sense, for example, were already compatible with his personality, regardless of politics. If some of his behaviours were affected, Crick concedes, they were for domestic 
trivial things, more comical rather than pretentious, showing a near-fanatical obsession with class to humorous effect. For instance, John Morris again remembers after sitting down with Orwell in the BBC canteen, quote, Orwell immediately poured his tea into the saucer and began to drink it with a loud sucking noise. He said nothing, but looked at me with a slightly defiant expression when I continued to drink my own tea in the normal fashion. The affected manners could also be puritanical, in a way that was almost juvenile. In another anecdote, Morris recalled Orwell's horrified reaction when, standing together at the bar of a pub, Morris had asked Orwell for, quote, beer, as opposed to bitter. Bitter is, of course, beer as well, but Orwell proceeded to ask the barmaid, quote, a pint of bitter, please, and a glass of beer for my friend. After, when Morris questioned him on this bizarre display of inverted snobbery, Orwell replied, you gave yourself away badly. A working class person would never ask for a glass of beer. Morris was never trying to be working class in the first place. Another friend remembered how Orwell talked to him about one of his new hobbies of visiting prisons. Quote, he said quite kindly that he supposed a lot of what he was saying must be quite incomprehensible to me. He probably never had to work outside a comfortable office. I never had to do a job of any sort with my hands. Orwell was dead wrong and the friend was understandably defensive. These examples could mislead you into thinking that his displays of commitment to socialism were exaggerated or staged for his audience. Fundamentally, Orwell was a serious man. He was also a true believer that one should organise one's private life in line with one's beliefs. As Crick notes, these simply came across as fanatical in the little homely details. To highlight that this was no charade, I'll provide a specific example of an interaction with a novelist named L. H. Myers, a friend of John Morris's. Myers hadn't met Orwell, but he was a great admirer, having followed his career earlier than most. Like Orwell, he was deeply hostile towards class privilege, and was in fact a generous philanthropist to the poor and humanitarian causes. When he discovered before the war, that Orwell was destitute and seriously ill with bronchial issues, Myers sent him an anonymous sum. This sum actually allowed George and Eileen to leave England and recover in Morocco. John Morris knew this and arranged for a meeting between the three of them. It's likely Orwell had connected the dots and decided it would be ungracious to decline an invitation to meet his anonymous benefactor however much it might have grated on his pride. But Myers was a man of fine tastes and good living, particularly during the war, and particularly from a man of a socialist disposition, this would have been reprehensible for Orwell. He had, in fact, initially been invited to dinner, but declined and met the pair at Morris's house instead. When he arrived, by way of a greeting, he said, quote, I suppose you two have been dining at Boulestin's, a French restaurant in Covent Garden, known for being one of the most expensive in London. He was right. In fact, Myers was one of the restaurant's directors. I should tell you now that at the end of Down and Out in Paris and London, Orwell vowed that he would, quote, never again enjoy a meal at a smart restaurant. And biographical accounts test to this. But nor apparently would he entertain the company of a champagne socialist. Morris was stunned by Orwell's indifference in the short period he came to chat. A few vague niceties, then Orwell sat staring silently at the fire. Conversation quickly faded. Orwell refused to humour either of them. Before long, Orwell made some, quote, lame excuse to leave, and that was that. Myers was deeply upset by Orwell's indifference, he even died several months later, making the memory especially painful for Morris. The next day at work, Orwell addressed Morris by his surname, something he hadn't done in months. Thereon, their relationship became purely formal, and withered out. Others have pointed out that Orwell was in fact, quote, no enemy of good living, that 
though he categorically avoided fine dining and luxury hotels, he very much enjoyed good food and good wine. As Anthony Pohl remarked, though, he was, quote, tortured by guilt when he felt that indulgence was overstepping the mark. Returning to the broader matter of his contrarianism, though, as we've seen, he would frequently lampoon the intelligentsia, sometimes deeply unfairly, if he found the slightest reason to disagree with them, even on minor matters. To the point of rudeness on many occasions, he wouldn't hesitate to call them fascists if he detected any whiff of authoritarianism in them. Anthony Pohl quite aptly diagnosed him with a form of, quote, persecution mania, memorably bashing with every fibre of his body, quote, every fruit juice drinker, nudist, sandal wearer, sex maniac, quaker, nature cure quack, pacifist, and feminist in England. This, I should add, is quite rich from the man who criticised socialists for their own persecutions. Quote, I get the impression that, to them, the socialist movement is a kind of exciting heresy hunt, a leaping to and fro of frenzied witch doctors to the tune of fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of a right-wing deviationist. It was as if he liked to lump people together in groups to drive home his own individuality, always with the presupposition that he possessed the truth and others were phonies, fools, or of course, fascists. He cheaply ridiculed serious movements like pacifism or feminism and mocked, as if they were even comparable, the perfectly innocuous habits of alcohol abstention or wearing sandals. Some of you may disagree. A particular low point for Orwell was when he slandered the poet W.H. Auden for his 1937 poem, Spain, inspired by the Spanish Civil War. It is a poem which, among other themes, explores the moral dilemma posed by war. Today, the deliberate increase in the chances of death, the conscious acceptance of guilt in the necessary murder. For this, Orwell opened fire. Quote, but notice the phrase, necessary murder. It could only be written by a person to whom murder is at most a word. Personally, I would not speak so lightly of murder it so happens that I have seen the bodies of numbers of murdered men. I don't mean killed in battle, I mean murdered. He goes on to write, quote, Mr. Auden's amoralism is only possible if you are the kind of person who is always somewhere else when the trigger is pulled. So much of left-wing thought is a kind of playing with fire by people who don't even know that the fire is hot. It is shocking how badly Orwell had missed the point. It is clear that Auden finds murder unconscionable, hence the, quote, guilt. And the fact that he calls a battlefield killing murder reinforces just how wrong it is. Just because it is a military death, a death inflicted at war, it is wrong to kill another human being. It is murder. And yet it is, quote, necessary for Auden, given the state of world affairs, to fight fascism. Murder is necessary for the sake of freedom. That was the point. Orwell missed it. This is easily the most damning of Orwell's writings, and one of his least flattering blemishes on public record. Fortunately, there are generally few, but it's an extreme case of his persecution mania at work. Moral posturing and a rash, ill-thought-out bashing, no doubt with homophobic prejudice. Orwell would later go on to call it a, quote, very good war poem while at the BBC, but Auden sadly withdrew it. Despite the jibe, Auden went on to praise Orwell for the rest of his life. The thing with Orwell was that he was so strong-minded in his beliefs and opinions, but could be eccentric and unreasonable inventing them, especially in print. Fundamentally, though, with the great exception of the Auden incident, he was, it seems, really quite an agreeable and an unusually empathetic person. I believe that part of the reason for this inappropriate side of Orwell was the fact that print media was the main public platform for polemics and debate in his time. And so, like internet trolls and Twitter twats, Orwell could write with a relative sense of anonymity and the consequent feeling of being unaccountable for his words.
He learned this the hard way. As he put it, useful advice to anyone in the age of social media, quote, when you meet anyone in the flesh, you realize immediately that he is a human being and not a sort of caricature embodying certain ideas. To somebody he'd bashed totally unfairly, he might then have said, as he did to one of his victims, shouldn't have said you're a fascist, sorry about that. He even wrote later in the press that it had been, quote, a quite unjustified statement based on a single article which I probably misunderstood. He also offensively called the English poet Sir Stephen Spender a Nancy boy for having various affairs with men. He later publicly apologised for using slurs on him and other, quote, parlor Bolsheviks. And after that, he even told his friend Cyril Connolly, quote, funny, I always used him and the rest of that gang as symbols of the pansy left. But when I met him in person, I liked him so much and was sorry for the things I had said about him. These sorts of heartfelt apologies would immediately endear these people to him, and several, including Stephen Spender, would go on to become good friends of his. But perhaps one of the most revealing examples of Orwell's agreeability triumphing over rebelliousness was his decision after Burma to take a pseudonym. Quitting the imperial service alone, given its importance to and sense of identity within his family, was enough cause for disgrace. His mother, Ida, was horrified, his father deeply disappointed. So it was even worse when the Blairs, born in the Victorian era, suffered the announcement that their Eric, who had already dashed their high hopes for him over his failings at Eton College, intended to become a writer. And you can only imagine their reactions when they found out about his tramping and kitchen portrait drawings. Orwell knew, of course, how irresponsible and downright ludicrous these would have appeared to his parents, and no doubt it heightened a strong sense of guilt from childhood and his failure to win a scholarship at Oxbridge. But his rebellion wasn't directed at them. It had the potential to be. Ida Blair, the genteel Anglo-Indian, and Richard Blair, former officer in the British Empire's Bengali Opium Department, of all things. But Orwell knew they were of a different age. In his father's case, he was dealing with a particularly inflexible and conservative mind. Great differences of character and opinion appeared to have caused a rift between Orwell and Richard Blair upon Orwell's return to Europe, but their relationship apparently softened over the years. Orwell did not discuss politics with his father or his father's career, knowing he would not bring him over to his side. And he would not allow his rebellion and literary career to disgrace his family, whom he clearly held dear, refusing to deepen what he imagined was his family's shame over his failures and U-turn. The great irony, of course, is that his father's past was potential source for equal, if not greater shame for Orwell. And so, before the publication of Down and Out in Paris and London, and with the knowledge that Burmese days was somewhere on the horizon, Eric Arthur Blair chose the defining pseudonym that he would go on to keep for life. To anticipate the skeptics, it would be wrong to say that he kept his lifelong pen name just for his family. Eric Blair's identity as a writer evolved hand in hand with George Orwell, so that they were one. He felt it was a strong English name for a writer's persona with which he could easily identify, and a model for a straight-talking, simple-living common man. Theories of a split personality are rather far-fetched. But then, it is important to remember the origins of this pen name, and to question just how much his parents, and especially his father's opinion, held sway over him. Could it, at least in part, explain the boldness of much of his work, his manic work schedule, his immense productivity over a 20-year career? One thing that is clear is that no matter how much his sense of failure weighed on him, it also lifted him, so that he was perpetually in rebellion against guilt and a deep sense of failure. In other words, he would always feel it, but he would not allow himself to be consumed by it. He could not have achieved what he did without that constant fire under him to in fact succeed.
So then it is of some comfort that in 1939, on Richard Blair's deathbed, the last words that the dying man would hear were those of an excellent review of Orwell's latest novel, Coming Up for Air. After years of little interest in, and little understanding of his son's literary and journalistic pathway, he had asked that the review be read aloud. Orwell's sister did so. It was in the Sunday Times, and was headlined, Mr George Orwell's Success. Richard passed away shortly after. Orwell later related the scene in a letter and added, I am very glad that latterly he had not been so disappointed in me as before. Orwell has the reputation of being emblematic of that elusive figure he clung on to so dearly, the common man. The honorary proletarian, his biographer Geoffrey Myers dubbed him. Well, what is a common man? There are many possible answers, so many that the word itself has questionable value if we're talking about anybody's personality. But take the definition Orwell would have chosen. The average person in the world, and therefore member of the dominant demographic, the working class. Down to earth, plain living, unpretentious, unmaterialistic. The diametrical opposite would be the educated elite, associated with wealth and its bourgeois genteel trimmings, or else a bohemian lifestyle, eccentric, unstable. For our purposes, let's take Orwell's definition, and the traits that, in addition to his no-nonsense Anglo-Saxon prose, make him an accessible figure with whom the average person may identify. Quote, I suppose what made Orwell so permanently attractive as a person and so readable as a writer, was that he was so ordinary, really, normal, if not average. He had none of the extravagances of an artist, none of the irresponsibilities of a bohemian, and none of the selfishness of an intellectual. These sorts of comments are very common by people who knew him. Poet Stephen Spender remembered, quote, He had a kind of quality about him that reminded one of plain living, bread and cheese, English beer, and so on. He had really rather a working man's kind of attitude. Orwell, of course, would have been immensely flattered by this. In the 1940 autobiographical note, which we saw in the introduction, Orwell felt compelled, with the limited word count he was granted, to include a list of his likes and dislikes. I like English cookery, and English beer, French red wines, Spanish white wines, Indian tea, strong tobacco, coal fires, candlelight, and comfortable chairs. I dislike big towns, noise, motor cars, the radio, tinned food, central heating, and modern furniture. This is all very much in keeping with the sort of image Orwell liked to project of himself. Bernard Crick, Orwell's biographer, notes a gradual process throughout his writing life of adopting this as an ideal image to be emulated, both for himself and for others. Quote, An image of integrity, honesty, simplicity, egalitarian conviction, plain living, plain writing, and plain speaking. This, though, as we've seen, was so gradual, even predating his commitment to socialism, that it happened organically and unaffectedly. He might have honed in on certain aspects of his personality publicly, but much of it was genuinely who he was. To begin, his love of nature, nurtured early in childhood, and which remained a steady passion throughout life. Perhaps not the best example of a common passion, but certainly the best example of being quite literally down to earth. It's not uncommon for great writers to appreciate nature, though it's often of a romantic or shallow interest. Orwell could well have been a naturalist. His private letters and diaries show a mind constantly observing, describing, documenting the natural world in flux. In Why I Write, he tells us about some of his earliest writings with typical self-deprecation, quote, bad and unusually unfinished nature poems in the Georgian style. A charismatic teacher at St. Cyprian's recognised an early interest in the outdoors, exposing a love of wildlife, particularly marine wildlife, as well as birds and butterflies. 
The latter was apparently mocked by Mrs. Wilkes in such such were the joys. And have you been catching little butterflies? She would say with a vicious sneer when one got back, making her voice as babyish as possible. Friends and acquaintances recalled that he was, as one put it, a quote, storehouse of information on the natural world. Birds in particular, though he was clearly highly knowledgeable on the flora and fauna of the British Isles. In the summer of 1930, he tutored three young boys in Southwold. They were simply captivated by this enigmatic, adventurous man who would lead them on outdoor adventures, bird watching, fishing, or teaching such odd lessons as the properties of marsh gases. Quote, it was like a voyage with Jules Verne beneath the ocean. The account left to us by one of the boys in adulthood is of special use to the biographer. What Orwell taught was what he found interesting and important. Not just this, the way in which somebody teaches also tells us a great deal about them. Quote, a walk was a mixture of energy, adventure, and matter of fact. The world we felt was just like this, and it would have been absurd not to notice all there was to see. Here we have some of the defining features of Orwell. An innate curiosity, a childlike wonder for the natural world, but then a coolness and pragmatism, a hands-on, fact-based approach to life. Quote, his attitude to animals and birds was rather like his attitude to children. He was at home with them. He seemed to know everything about them and found them amusing and interesting. Perhaps he thought of them like children, as uncorrupted by the pursuit of power and riches, living for the moment and caring little for organised exploitation of each other. Sentimental, but hardly too far-fetched a thought. One of Orwell's most charming and original essays, Some Thoughts on the Common Toad, describes the traits of his amphibian subject, but takes the theme for a walk, or perhaps a leap, to contemplate the wonders of spring, the irresistible resurrection of nature, even in the rubbled misery of post-war London. Quote, There must be some hundreds of thousands, if not millions of birds, living inside the four-mile radius, and it is rather a pleasing thought that none of them pays a half-penny of rent. But he also extends his musings to the barren, soulless grip of totalitarianism, still suffocating swathes of Eastern Europe and Asia. Quote, How many a time have I stood watching the toads mating, or a pair of hares having a boxing match in the young corn, and thought of all the important persons who would stop me enjoying this if they could. 1984, on a similar note, presents nature in direct contrast with the grim, war-torn, thermonuclear world of Airstrip 1. Much like the coral paperweight Winston finds in the fateful junk shop, nature, or the golden country, is an idyllic glimpse of a pre-dystopian world, unravaged by bombs, missiles, or the crushing tide of industrialization. It is the childhood world of George Bowling in Coming Up for Air, a repository of youthful wonder, a place of innocence and simplicity, but it is always Orwell's voice, and it is always the England of his childhood. Gentle, sleepy, rural Edwardian England. That is the golden country in 1984. Quote, I am not able, and do not want completely, to abandon the worldview that I acquired in childhood. So long as I remain alive and well, I shall continue to love the surface of the earth. Some of Orwell's most lyrical writing on sublime themes, what he might have called, quote, purple pastures, relate to nature. They are testaments not just to his writing flair, but to his lifelong interest in the natural world and its conscious observation. One author has even posited the interesting theory that the precocious and lifelong naturalist in Orwell might account for some of his greatness. Always immersing himself, always alert to and actually seeing what was directly under his nose when others did not. Consider widespread oblivion on nature, despite its omnipresence, and the advantages of a naturalist by comparison. The theory holds water. Orwell also skillfully captured animal behaviour, using striking similes and metaphors throughout his writing. To cite just a few, quote, that preoccupied grandmotherly air that elephants have, in his famous essay on his time in Burma, 
or it is usual to speak of the fascist objective as the beehive state, which does a grave injustice to bees. A world of rabbits ruled by stoats would be nearer the mark. Of course, Animal Farm might not be the masterpiece it is, had it not been informed by first-hand and prolonged contact with domestic and barnyard animals. The attributes and roles of the characters on the farm were well picked based on animal behaviour, from the unflinching obedience of the dogs to the strong-willed gentle stallion. Orwell and his first wife Eileen tended to a farm for years in their Hertfordshire cottage, which also doubled as a general store. The author's diaries in this period, while peppered with some interesting insights on international events and political developments, are the work of a man faithfully recording the weather, his observations on his natural surroundings, updates on his barnyard animals, particularly his goat, Muriel, and the daily number of eggs hatched. They recreated their agricultural life while living in Marrakesh before the war, raising similar animals but with the added difficulty of a different climate and terrain. In Orwell's case, perhaps the temptation of native wild animals too. Quote, Gazelles are almost the only animals that look good to eat when they are still alive. In fact, one can hardly look at their hindquarters without thinking of mint sauce. In Jura, Scotland, he also kept animals, as a widower and a dying adoptive father. The usual sheep and cows, but also a pig, for the first time in his life, and funnily enough, as late as 1948, nearly five years after writing Animal Farm. Quote, I had never kept one before, and shan't be sorry to see the last of this one. They are most annoying, destructive animals, and hard to keep out of anywhere because they are so strong and cunning. It's almost as if he'd written a book on the theme. Quote, I simply have to have a bit of garden and a few animals, he once told a friend, and in his autobiographical entry wrote, Outside my work, the thing I care most about is gardening, especially vegetable gardening. Relevant diary entries and letters could fill a tome. They're testaments to his need for and love of the outdoors, a workmanlike streak as well as his self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency was very much in his character, a product of his pragmatism, his fondness for simplicity, his independence. In the early months of the war, to provide just one example, Orwell was convinced that England would be invaded and planted an enormous crop of potatoes. No doubt this facet also played into his lifelong class rebellion and the lifestyle this entailed. An early female friend was surprised to learn that he could sew and cook well, his cooking was praised by several others too. In the 1940s, he took up carpentry. Anthony Pohl remembered him saying, in a manner quite typical of his flexes on plain living and autonomy, don't you ever feel you need to do something with your hands? I'm surprised you don't. I like even rolling my own cigarettes. I've installed a lathe down in the basement. I don't think I could live here without my lathe. This self-sufficiency could appear as eccentric, but then he would have been a useful person to have around if you were stranded on a desert island. In fact, he practically lived on one. There's no better example of an extreme form of this self-reliance than his decision to move to Jura, one of the most remote and inhospitable parts of the British Isles. He once told a friend that his ideal home was a lighthouse, only the fact of raising an adopted son made this impossible. Any average lighthouse, though, would probably have been closer to civilization than his Barnhill home. In the rain-soaked Isle of Jura, sometimes a 48-hour journey from London, combining trains, buses, taxi, boats, and foot. It is odd that he moved to Scotland, away from his beloved England. It's a suggestion of how desperate he was after the war for total seclusion. He hated London, but had felt he needed to stay there. As he had told a friend during the Blitz, you can't leave London when people are being bombed to hell. Anthony Pohl wrote, like most people in rebellion, Orwell was more than half in love with that he was rebelling against. Traditional English food, English countryside, English customs, pubs, the gentle manners of its people. He loved roast beef and warm beer, quote, with veritable hops. The anglophobic intelligentsia, he wrote, on the other hand, quote, took their cooking from Paris and their ideas from Moscow. This was the man who wrote an essay, 
describing the many idiosyncratic features of his favourite pub, before revealing at the end that the pub was in fact fictitious, and he proceeds to ask the reader at the end to get in touch should they know of any pub that met the criteria. This was also the man who wrote a perfectly serious article on his 11 rules for the perfect, and one should add, ridiculously strong cup of tea. His literary tastes in particular have been described as old-fashioned, influenced above all by writers active in the Victorian and Edwardian eras. His old friend Cyril Connolly famously called Orwell a revolutionary who was in love with the 1900s. He did often romanticise England and Englishness in his literature and political work, but ever the voice of moderation, it was always tempered. The average English person, besides an ingrained respect for law and constitution, besides gentle manners and a fondness for privacy, was in his view also unartistic, lazy, unintellectual, xenophobic, and possessing of a total aversion to abstract thought. The important fact though is that he thought a great deal about this idea of an English national character, writing many of his conclusions in his 1941 work the Lion and the Unicorn, Socialism and the English Genius. And as Bernard Crick notes, it was one of the very few serious pieces on the matter of the English national character to date. Was there a personal reason for this intense, almost obsessive Anglophilia? Some have suggested that there are certain biographical details that might account for a rosy-eyed view of his country, an over-exaggerated English identity, or even just an unusual interest in the national character. The fact he was born in India, for example, that he had an Anglo-Indian family, that he was of Scottish descent, that his mother was half French, or the fact of his privileged, sheltered education at Eton, an elitist bubble, or as Orwell put it, a quote, lukewarm bath of snobbery. It often takes somebody on the fringes of a nationality, neither out nor totally in, to have the most clear-eyed views on the national people with whom they've associated and above all, an uncommon interest in their particularities. He persistently jabbed at the intelligentsia on many counts for a complete lack of patriotism. Quote, It is a strange fact, but it is unquestionably true, that almost any English intellectual would feel more ashamed of standing to attention during God Save the King than stealing from a poor box. Religion is an interesting one for Orwell, as he was atheist but culturally Anglican, he sometimes attended Mass, particularly in the early 1930s while in Southwold. Both of his weddings were Anglican ceremonies, his second even officiated while in hospital. And he left instructions for burial according to the rites of the Anglican Church. Most of his views were intellectually incompatible with constitutional monarchy or the teachings of the Anglican Church. But unlike absolute monarchy or Roman Catholicism, he saw these as benign, and in fact, socially beneficial. His patriotism, and his encouragement that others ought to be patriotic as well, meant any intellectual contradictions were secondary to the value of tradition, and its power to unite a nation. During the war, he considered that English patriotism could be the binding force for a socialist revolution necessary to defeat Hitler and prevent totalitarianism, that the common decency sense of justice and democratic biases of the English people could be married to a non-violent political upheaval. Much of Orwell's writing during the early 1940s were rallying calls for revolution, which he felt was being hampered by an unpatriotic, Stalinoid intelligentsia. English patriotism, he argued, could allow even conservatives to accept socialism, quote, building a socialist on the bones of a blimp, he wrote. The fact that revolutionaries can still cling on to an idea of nationhood proved, quote, the power of one kind of loyalty to transmute itself into another, the spiritual need for patriotism and the military virtues, for which, however little the boiled rabbits of the left may like them, no substitute has yet been found. He recognised that his own patriotism had been inculcated early on in life, especially in early 20th century Britain, and all its jingoism. So he recognised that it was tinged with emotion, but again, he saw rational, constructive value in patriotism. Quote, 
To this day, it gives me a faint feeling of sacrilege, not to stand to attention during God Save the King. That is childish, of course, but I would sooner have that kind of upbringing than be like the left-wing intellectuals who are so enlightened that they cannot understand the most ordinary emotions. It is exactly the people whose hearts have never leapt at the sight of a Union Jack who will flinch from revolution when the moment comes. And Orwell stresses that his revolutionary views were perfectly compatible with his patriotism. Quote, Patriotism has nothing to do with conservatism. It is devotion to something that is changing, but is felt to be mystically the same. He could be loyal to a future socialist England, while remaining loyal to Chamberlain's or Churchill's England in the face of Hitler. The problem was the people in charge, and the present system. England is, quote, a rather stuffy Victorian family, in which the young are generally thwarted, and most of the power is in the hands of irresponsible uncles and bedridden aunts. Still, it is a family. It has its private language and its common memories, a family with the wrong members in control. These political rallying calls, his persistent efforts to enlist and fight, his efforts with the Home Guard, his work at the BBC, these are the acts of an unabashed patriot in some of Britain's darkest hours. It's the same spirit encapsulated in the last line of The Lion and the Unicorn, I believe in England. <laughs>